In the summer of 2003, Rebecca Dirksen traveled with a group of fellow Lawrence University students and their professor to assist with a youth music camp in Leogan, Haiti. In this small coastal city renowned for its festive traditions, Rebecca encountered a world that would entrance her for years to come. She studied Haiti while pursuing her master's and doctoral degrees, and to date has spent approximately seven years in the country, working as a scholar, musician, music producer, and social activist. Over time, she has achieved fluency in the Haitian Creole language and has developed deep knowledge of Haitian society and culture. So Rebecca could have written any number of books about Haiti, and I believe she has a few in the works at the moment. But the book that was published by Oxford University Press last year, and that we have before us now, is After the Dance, The Drums Are Heavy, Carnival, Politics, and Musical Engagement in Haiti. It is a wonderful study of the songs that musicians compose each year for the pre-Lenten carnival season, and of what these songs reveal about the intricate politics of contemporary Haiti. The Haitian carnival, like other carnivals of the plantation and post-plantation regions of the Americas, is a collective creation on a vast scale, an annual explosion of artistic expression, pleasure, an ever ramifying significance that mesmerizes and confounds all observers. Fortunately, Rebecca approaches Carnival with humility, with an awareness that it is impossible to contain the festival in any orderly set of descriptions, theoretical frameworks, or definitive arguments. Indeed, she has produced a book that is something of a carnival itself, with a multiplicity of voices spiraling intertextual references, and much disruption of conventional order. Rebecca's primary objective in this study is to explore the intersections of carnival music making and political action in Haiti, particularly how popular songs frame public issues and enable ongoing debates among musicians and their audiences. Musicians disseminate new songs in advance of each year's carnival via audio recordings, music videos, and radio broadcast. They then perform the songs on flatbed trucks during the three days before Ash Wednesday, as crowds of revelers join in processions through city streets. The excitement that these songs generate in the context of carnival festivity resembles the energy manifested in crowds in street-based, music-driven political demonstrations. For Haitians, both carnival and public rallies are settings for enrage, frenzy-making or enragement, and engagé, political engagement. Rebecca elucidates processes of song composition and audience mobilization by examining the work of a variety of well-known musicians in Haiti. Her linguistic expertise and extensive knowledge of Haitian cultural traditions and current affairs enable her to offer insightful analyses of the verbal strategies that composers employ in constructing complex, multi-layered messages for their listeners. Among the typical features of these songs are trenchant critiques of social conditions and political events, pithy but veiled attacks on public figures, wry humor, vulgar and defiant expressions, allusions to other popular songs, and evocative references to Haitian folklore and the myriad spirits of the Vodou system of belief. Since many songs are released as music videos, Rebecca also discusses the dramatis personae and imagery of these productions which frequently includes satirical skits. In her interpretations, she is always attentive to ambiguities and the fact that songs can be read in different ways. To this end, she presents excerpts of interviews with featured musicians and of conversations with acquaintances. Audio and video clips on the book's companion website provide additional perspectives. I'll offer two examples of musicians whom Rebecca profiles. 
first is Michelle Martelli, also known as Sweet Mickey. Born into a prominent family, Martelli was a key figure during the 1980s and 1990s in modernizing the sound of compa, Haitian dance music, by reducing the size of ensembles and expanding electronic instrumentation. Along with his musical talents, he cultivated a hedonistic reputation and was renowned for his ribald banter and general outrageousness during performances. As his career developed, he thrilled middle and upper class audiences in nightclubs in Port-au-Prince, Miami, New York, and Montreal, but also developed strong support among grassroots Haitians. Indeed, he was one of the most popular artists in Carnival during the 1990s and 2000s, with audiences enthusiastically following his witty song battles with other musicians. In 1994, Martelli released a song in which he announced his aspiration to be a president who played compa. Then in 2011, he managed to parlay an image as the people's choice into actually winning Haiti's presidential election. Rebecca quotes an acquaintance who said she would vote for Martelli because Haiti needed a vagabond, a disruptive rascal as a leader in order to deal with all the other vagabonds in the country. Martelli's term in office, 2011 to 2016, was marked by a variety of challenges and controversies. By the end, he was attacking two prominent journalists in a carnival song, and a few months later, he was again performing in a Miami nightclub, ready to take on as many critics. So Martelli moved seamlessly from popular music scholar to president of Haiti and back to professional musician. The Caribbean is known for charismatic political leaders who inspire mass followings through oratory and public theatrics, but Martelli was the first to merge the personas of major musician and head of government. A second example of artists featured in Rebecca's book is the famous band Bookman Experience, led by Theodore Bobra and Mima Rose Bobra. Some of you may recall that for the Society for Ethnomusicology 2019 annual meeting, Rebecca managed to bring Bukman experience all the way from Haiti to Bloomington, a truly remarkable feat that was enjoyed by all. The band's name references a Voto priest who is believed to have helped launch the Haitian Revolution, an event of global significance that brought both the end of slavery in Haiti and independence from France in 1804. During the 1970s, a new predominantly middle-class youth movement emerged in Haiti that celebrated the nation's illustrious past, its Creole language, and its rich array of folk traditions. The members of Bukman Esperance were active in this movement and central to the development of a popular music style known as Mizek Razin, roots music. Since the late 1970s, the band has been using musical performance, both during carnival and in other settings, to critique authoritarian politics, neo-colonialism, and socioeconomic inequality. Rebecca analyzes, among various songs, their 2016 carnival music video, Motherless Zombies, a work that suggests that the Haitian population is surrendering its agency and drifting away from the La Coupe a combined family compound and voto yard that signifies tradition, community, and collective action. Bukman Experience has continued to convey a message of cultural roots and civic participation, both in their music and in various community projects. Throughout her book, Rebecca demonstrates that the Haitian Carnival is an ongoing conversation expansive enough to include voices as diverse as those of Bukman Experience and Michel Martelli. Year after year, the Haitian people assemble for a season of public theater that is played out in the streets, in the media, and in day-to-day -day talk. In short, Carnival offers a special festive realm in which people are able to examine the contours of their world, imagine alternatives, and assert new courses of action. Rebecca concludes her provocative study by stating, quote, when other avenues have been less productive, 
carnival and the carnivalesque have offered a space and a mechanism for addressing partially serious matters through playful acts and humor, for playing out the frictions between engagé and enragé, as states of being, end quote. However, the festive excitement always ends and Haitian people and the Haitian people have to return to the difficult work of actually changing the economic and political conditions of their nation, while also contending with the global forces that continue to shape these conditions. As is stated in a Haitian proverb, after the dance, the drums are heavy. I strongly recommend reading this book by Rebecca Dirksen to learn more about music, celebration, and struggle in contemporary Haiti. Hello, everybody. I'm happy to join you today and participate in this book festival. Especially, I'm delighted to be commenting on a book I thoroughly enjoyed reading, Solimar Otero's Archives of Conjure, Stories of the Dead in Afro-Latinx Cultures, published by Columbia University Press in the year 2020. I can show you what the book looks like. Yeah, this is it. It's very intriguing uh, cover, very intriguing inside as well. On the back, it's blurbed by, among others, Norma Cantu and Christina Wirtz. Christina Wirtz is a wonderful author, an expert on Santeria. Let me begin with a shout out to ethnomusicologist Martha Ellen Davis, who brought this quaint tradition of the book festival to us from Harvard when she came as a visiting professor some years ago. Now, let me talk about this book. In a gracious note solely put, placed in my copy of her Archives of Conjure, she tells me that this book is like a child to her, and I am here to praise this child, for she has created a precocious child, better yet, a child genius, who trailing clouds of glory has come to us to illuminate the pathway to a luminous domain. In four pithy chapters, plus an introduction and conclusion, Soli takes us into a scintillating world, or more accurately, into a world-making process powered by what she terms a Caribbean ritual poetics. The all-embracing framework, Archives of Conjure, is rooted in practices that evoke and invoke the dead, who are not really departed, and the orichas, deities traceable to traditional religions of Africa, but who have acquired new life and vitality since enslaved Africans brought them to new world settings. Conjure being the summoning of these spirits, these archives are no dusty collection of old official documents, but rather a living, breathing assemblage that does include written records running the gamut from writings of scholars such as Lydia Cabrera, Ruth Landes, and Fernando Ortiz, to scraps of paper bearing hasty notations of instructions from the spirits. But more centrally, it is an archive richly populated with intersecting oralities in the form of songs, stories, chants and incantations. And the holdings of this archive extend even to material artifacts crafted in the image of spirit presences or at their behest. Soli's Archives of Conjure develops a fluid analytics perfectly suited to this fluid study object. The task as Soli describes it is, quote, trying to explain deeply held beliefs that create ways of being in the world not readily understood by outsiders, end quote. It becomes clear that Soli is an insider to the two worlds implicated here, the world of Espiritismo, Santeria, and Palo, as practiced in Cuba and in other Afro-Latinx settings, and the world of folkloristics, as practiced, for example, in Bloomington. 
and that she is engaged in a project that has great meaning and importance to her, that of bringing these two worlds into some kind of momentary connection. I am an hija de las dos aguas, she tells us, referencing Yamaya, the majestic oricha of the sea, and Ochun, the river deity. Water is the pervasive medium in her commentary from the rippling waters of river currents that conceal and reveal the stones beneath their courses to the sea foam with its rhythmic effervescence where the sea meets the land. The flow of water becomes in Soli's account, a material embodiment of the flow of cultures, of spiritual creolization, and ultimately of spiritual ecologies in placing humans in a natural cycle realized through relationships to the divine. Chapter four, Sirens, adduces the play of Caribbean poetics in a parallel realm of drag, where, and I quote, folklore fosters tales of taboo behavior as irreverent versions of sacred history, end quote. She finds in the work of Mayra Santos Febres, acclaimed Afro-Puerto Rican author, a resonant treatment of the sirena, the siren, who in this rendering embodies the same gender mutability that Soli has located for us in the seminal works of Cabrera and Landes. This chapter takes us into the world of divas and divascapes where transformistas, Latinx and Afro-Latinx drag queens, recenter the bolero's inherent sentimiento to signify alternative generative histories. This agile fusion of frameworks enables Soli to persuasively argue that, quote, the transformista and the oricha use the frame of performative play for the expression of contested meanings, ironies, and productive tensions. I note in passing that the corrido makes a cameo appearance here as the ruggedly masculine counterpart to the more pliable bolero. I want to pick up momentarily on the theme of performativity, a theme that runs through the pages of this book and that interests me in particular. Performativity, the power of artfully constructed communication to make things happen in the world. Soli perceives, quote, performative moments of becoming, end quote, in ritual settings, in the misas where the archives of conjure are activated, and even in interview sessions, which can mutate into storytelling, shifting from conveyance of information to transformation of being. These insights into ritual efficacy are of critical importance to folklorists as we try to unravel the intricate social aesthetics of ritual practices. Solimar Otero's Archives of Conjure offers a fascinating study of a remarkable system of belief and practice that is vividly Caribbean as it wrestles with, quote, unresolved representations of race, religious difference, sexuality, and gender, end quote. In the flow of ritual engagement, counter-normative formulations can be envisioned and applied to people's life situations. But spiraling outward from this Caribbean foundation, the Archives of Conjure speaks with a fresh and compelling voice to key facets of the Latin American experience. And beyond that, to basic realities of the human condition marked as it is by an extravagance of imagination trained on the quest for viability in an uncertain world. Congratulations solely on this wonderful product. I am confident that your child will travel far in the world. Folk Illusions, Children, Folklore, and Sciences of Perception is a scholarly study of the wide range of children's games that are based on sensory illusions. Some of the better known of these are floating arms in which sudden removal of downward pressure on arms creates the feeling that they are rising upwards of their own volition 
twisted hands, the first of several forms of finger contortion, which send our cognitive processing of tactile sensation into a tailspin, combine our strengths in which an illusion of uncanny lightness is induced by the distri distribution of a lifting task among multiple par participants, and ping pong, in which a simulation of the sound of the game leads to an audience's communal suspension of disbelief around the absence of an actual ball going back and forth. The book's authors, K. Brandon Barker and Claiborne Rice, draw on their own fieldwork and collection, as well as many strands of research and theory, especially from folkloristics and cognitive sciences. For many, the rich data on these amusements and their context, along with other trending topics such as embodiment, will be the most riveting aspect of the book. But I would like to emphasize rather the longer term intellectual context of this work. The first aspect is the attention that the authors give to the intellectual history of the idea of sensory illusion with emphasis on classical Greek philosophers, but also with some side trips such as the role of the notion of illusion or the veil of Maya in Hindu thought. I am especially struck by a quotation from Aristotle's Metaphysics in which the philosopher seems to be talking about his so-called so law of contradiction or the principle that any given thing cannot both be and not be in the same time and in the same sense. You cannot find a deeper principle in Western epistemology. It is held to be the linchpin of symbolic logic and by some of mathematics as well. And in the first half of the 20th century, ethnologist Lucien Levy Bruhl famously and infamously held it up as the most radical principle in terms of which different systems of thought might be compared. And yet in the midst of his heady metaphysical discourse, here we have old Aristotle going on about the, the cross finger trick. Barker's and Rice's comments on Plato are also interesting. It does seem that his leaping to his doctrine of the forms would have been fueled in part by the experience of, of the illusoriness of the senses. Given the fallibility of the senses, one option is to attempt to leave the senses behind and go instead with pure intellect in the quest for truth. Another aspect of intellectual context I would like to mention is a present day inclination to rethink any or all of the great structuring binaries of the last few centuries, here most especially the contrast of folklore and science. My sense is that the great binaries will not be entirely dismantled, but will for the most part be shown to be less categorical, more blurred, interspersed, and more interesting than has been typically assumed. Rather than resorting to the ploy of juxtaposing Western academic and folk traditions in order to insinuate that the latter is somehow better, Barker and Rice instead bring the traditions together to see what light they might shed on one another. It seems that in the academic tradition, illusion is taken up mostly into the discourse of critical epistemology. Following Barker and Rice's, Rice's lead, it would seem to play the critical epistemology role in folk tradition as well. And I would add that folk illusions may have something in common with other genres, including proverb, fable, <clears throat> and urban legend that in different ways remind us that appearances can be deceiving and of the need to remain nimble and awake. But in folk traditions, such illusions are also more than just critical epistemology. They give rise to realms of aesthetics, play, and entertainment, from child's games to the prestidigitation type of magic. Earlier, early in the book, Barker and Rice cite a basic truth. People enjoy illusory perceptions. Regarding the future of Barker's and Rice's work, we should harbor no illusions. This book cannot be the final work on the subject since the contributing disciplines and especially the cognitive sciences are still in their infancy. But the book does lay a magnificent groundwork for this topic and indeed seems to be written with a gaze into the future, evident in numerous forward-looking suggestions 
and illustrations. For example, on how to identify and describe context and performance factors, taxonomize and catalog, catalog types of illusions and their variants, and carry out fieldwork within this quirky and sometimes elusive genre. Some of the author's most interesting discussions develop around the boundary conditions of this genre. Do mirror summoning such as Bloody Mary involve sensory illusion or does this particular illusion transpire at some other psychological level? The illusion called the shoulder tap is tapped by Barker and Rice to launch a nuanced discussion of the complicated interrelationship between sensory motor and social interactional factors that combine to support some illusions. Barker and Rice rather cautiously raise the possibility that the cross finger trick, known as Aristotle's illusion because he wrote about it, may have existed before Aristotle. If I have a friendly quibble with Barker and Rice's book, it is that the authors are too cautious here. Numerous factors indicate that the early philosophers were steeped in the folklore of their time and place. Whether Plato's fretting about what we should do with old myths and legends, such as the story of Atlantis, or Aristotle's citing of familiar proverbs in his Nicomachean Ethics. One hears that history is written by the victors. Even more prosaically, we should note that it is written by writers. Here we have a task, imagining an embodied folk tradition carried on not primarily in writing, but by word of mouth and example, that can only be pieced together through inference. Carlo Ginsburg would seem to be the master of such technique. In reading the fascinating discussion and looking over the diagrams of finger contortions in folk illusions, the thought occurred to me that the experience of sensory illusion is cognitively so deep and central to human mental life that we really should find a place for it in our evolutionary origin myth. It turns out that we have some help from our ancient progenitors in that regard, because as I understand it, though I'm not an expert here, the earliest human self portrayals in Western art are of fingers, namely in the outlines of human hands depicted in upper Paleolithic cave art. Some of these images appear to be children's hands, and in some cases, the fingers appear to be deformed. Ritual, abetted by ethnographic analogy, <clears throat> has long been a convenient fallback explanation for archaeologists when perplexed. If you don't know what it is, just say probably a ritual object. And here, the archaeospeculative mind has leapt to the idea of ritual amputation. Other scholars, however, have argued that the cave images can as easily represent finger contortions rather than amputations. One scholar has summarized the possible reasons for finger deformations seen in the cave paintings under four hypotheses. Ritual, disease, frostbite, or kids playing. And that if, if that last hypothesis sounds familiar, there's our opening. Just outside the cave, perhaps one would also see other people playing combine our strengths, discovered unintentionally while dragging home a giant uh, tusk of a woolly mammoth, then reimagined as a game to the astonishment and delight of the paleo community. Once again, the book is Folk Illusions, Children, Folklore, and Sciences of Perception by K. Brandon Barker and Claiborne Rice, Indiana University Press, as they say in better bookstores everywhere. Hello, friends. I hope you're all safe and well. I'm honored to be with you today to talk about Henry Glassie's newest book, Daniel Johnston, A Portrait of the Artist, as a potter in North Carolina. It's a um, handsome product of Indiana University Press, published in 2020. And here's a mug made by Daniel to stand for him and keep water at my right hand in case I need it. I want to begin with an acknowledgement. I know Daniel Johnston. I think it's fair to say that I know him reasonably well, though of course not nearly as well as I do now, having read the book. 
I was introduced to him by Henry in 2011 when I was building a collection of southern U.S. pottery for the Museum of International Folk Art in Santa Fe. And we became acquainted over the next few years as I prepared an exhibition there which opened in 2014. During that time, I came to know Daniel as an unusual person in many ways, among them his background, outlook on life, and proclivity for reflection. He's someone who, by nature, is full of surprises. In his work, above all, he's constantly stretching himself, setting new goals, and taking on challenges, things that are likewise true, I would add, of Henry and his work which is to say, by way of beginning my tribute for today's celebration, that I find the book's subject and its author to be a terrific match, and I have good reason to think that you will too. We're all familiar with the hallmarks of Henry's work, and this book, no less than his others, displays them. Graceful prose, beautiful and informative photographs, clearly detailed drawings, interesting endnotes, and always an invaluable bibliography. Every book Henry writes rewards the reader and stands as a model of masterful fieldwork and learned scholarship. This one is informed by seven years of focused work with Daniel and another five of knowing and watching him before the project began. It's enriched as well by Henry's decades-long interest in North Carolina's pottery tradition and interest furthered by the work of its leading scholar and his close colleague, Terry Zook. The book is a blend of biography and ethnography, a genre beloved by folklorists for its utility in exploring an individual's relationship with tradition, as this book does. Its seven chapters consider Daniel's artistic development chronologically within his life history and ethnographically in his community and its shared aesthetic values. As Henry explains in an afterword, he has borrowed James Joyce's word portrait to characterize his book's form as well as to signal its time frame. It ends as Joyce's portrait did at a still open point in the subject's life. Indeed, we notice at once that the subtitle of Henry's book, A Portrait of the Artist as a Potter in North Carolina, does not include the word young, but it implies it. As we discover in the reading, Daniel is 42 when the study concludes. The community aspect of Henry's portrait is substantial and significant. We're given a full view of the many artists among whom Daniel lives and works in the long-standing pottery-making center of Seagrove, which is not on the coast, as you might think, but it's right in the heartland of North Carolina in its Piedmont area. These potters in Seagrove, elders, descendants of old pottery families, newcomers and learners, are all well drawn but one, the master Mark Hewitt, with whom Daniel apprenticed, is prominent. The book is dedicated to him, he's quoted in its first paragraph, and his voice steadily recurs throughout its pages, commenting on Daniel's growth. This is fitting not only because Mark was Daniel's teacher, but also because, Henry tells us, he more than anyone is responsible for the current vitality of the community's pottery scene. Reading Henry's accounts of one, Mark's backstory, and two, the hundred-year-old history of Seagro's famous Jugtown pottery, readers will understand another implication of the book's Joycean subtitle. It's all about modernism, plunked down in rural Carolina, thriving. In all this, the book holds its firm focus on Daniel as the community's new rising star and traces him as he moves into, around, and to the edges of tradition, even beyond. Daniel's is a great story, and Henry's in-depth telling is a real treat. 
I offer a taste in hopes of whetting your appetite for more. It relates Daniel's beginnings as a farm boy, a high school dropout, and at age 16, a production potter in Seagrove, making 30,000 pots a year. It details the four-year period Daniel calls the most important in his life, his apprenticeship with Mark Hewitt, who with direct ties to the English arts and crafts movement, opened his mind and transformed him into a budding artist. It includes travel to Southwest England for study with potters there and a second apprenticeship, this one in the Mekong Delta of Thailand, Asia being a source of inspiration for modernist potters like Daniel, where he made huge jars for storing fish paste and worked in beautiful partnership with a man with whom he could not converse since he didn't know the language. It shifts to a phase in which Daniel settles back into the life in Seagrove, marries Kate, herself a hard-working potter, builds a home and shop, and comes into his own as an artist. The art Daniel creates on his uh, centers on his love of large jars, exhibited in sizable groups. Um, one was uh, included 100. Uh, to call attention to their variations and commonalities. Whatever particular arrangement Daniel gives them, they provide context for one another and compel contemplation by viewers. As Daniel tells Henry, the pot becomes part of something else, something grander. It's a building block rather than something in and of itself. Without doubt, the groupings effectively magnify an inherent, ineffable power each pot projects on its own through a height and circumference that evoke the human body. Daniel calls these groupings installations. His most recent and radical one is outdoors, on the grounds of the North Carolina Museum of Art. Its individual elements, this time 178, are not pots at all, but columns made of clay, which Daniel set on the rolling terrain in such a manner that their tops align. Like his groups of pots, this installation, he says, is a statement about humanity. From afar, one sees unity. Up close, one sees seemingly endless, small, but distinct differences. Notably, the columns' distinctions are marks of hand-building and wood-firing local North natural materials, the very things that define Seagrove's pottery tradition. Daniel's installations have caught, caught the attention of the art world by blasting its distinctions between art and craft. Exhilarated and exhausted by his latest effort, which Henry describes in the final chapter, Daniel feels he's at the end of an arc and he's ready to move to a new phase, perhaps a return to traditional forms. Henry doesn't try to answer the question of what might come next for Daniel or for Seagrove. Indeed, his book reminds us that one never knows what might crop up for an artist or what unexpected turns a tradition might take. But informed by his close and up-to-date study of a potter in North Carolina, we can watch with heightened awareness as the future unfolds there or wherever we conduct our own research. So thanks, Henry, for this fascinating, inspiring book, and thanks all for helping celebrate it.